I see you twice, Thomas. Oh yeah, two angles. Oh, I see that's you cool. <laughs> How come I don't have that? There's two angles. <laughs> I know, right? Jeez. I don't have it either, so don't feel jealous. I'm very jealous. <laughs> I know, right? I don't have it either, so don't feel jealous. I'm very yeah. jealous. Hmm? Yeah. I see you twice, Thomas. Oh yeah, two angles. Oh, I see that's you cool. cool. <laughs> How come I don't have that? There's two <laughs> I know, right? Jeez. I don't have it either, so don't feel jealous. I'm very jealous. I don't have it either, so don't feel jealous. I'm very yeah. jealous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is episode four of Awareness Tuesdays. Thank you so much for being here. I am Brian, uh, CEO of Launch Global. We are a uh, artist co-op and a uh, wonderful new music platform. And uh, we are here with our amazing partners at Saving Jane. Uh, we have an amazing show for you tonight. Uh, we all kind of got together and you know, around these crazy COVID times, folks are, are online even more than usual. So uh, we just wanted to create a program where we could share tips for safety and uh, just how to remain socially involved and how to create, you know, different humanitarian progress while we're all stuck in quarantine and surfing the web. So uh, Awareness Tuesday was born. And uh, I'm so, so thrilled to, to share and it with twice, you. And, Thomas. and thank you for joining. And uh, now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my pal and our amazing host, Ethan Brooks Paisley. Ethan, how are you? Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Awareness Tuesdays. If you're new, here you are. Welcome. And if you're coming back, thank you so much for supporting this bi weekly show we've been doing to as Brian said, raise awareness on human trafficking amidst COVID-19 when it's especially impacted. Um, so I want to first give a really warm welcome to all of our co-panelists we have here today. Um, all of you guys are so inspiring welcome. and amazing. And I'd love to go around and just tell a little bit about how um, we're connected to Awareness Tuesdays and, and um, what we've we brought to the table today. So let's start with, um, I can start with myself. You know, I, I collaborated with Brian and Kathy Ann at Saving Jane to, to bring this together and um, have been hosting every week. So yeah, just um, to pass it along now to Indrani. Hello, I'm Indrani Paul Chaudhry. I'm a director and a photographer and a social justice advocate. And I'm also on the board of Saving Jane because I'm very passionate about fighting trafficking. And I am working on a film with Ethan um, to fight trafficking and to raise awareness of all of the problems involved and um, give everyone an insight into how they can help. So I'm thrilled to be here with you guys today. Awesome. Kathy, you want to talk a little sure. bit? Hi, I'm Kathy Ann Powell, the founder and the CEO of Saving J. And Awareness Tuesday started with a phone call with Ethan. We were saying, what are we going to do about educating um, everyone that's at home about human trafficking? And he's like, it should be Awareness Tuesday. I'm like, let's call Brian up. And that's how it all happened. Thank you, Ethan. Awesome. And hey, Thomas, you want to talk about your work with Saving Jane as well? Sure, my name is uh, Thomas Eslo. I'm the Director of Storytelling and Prevention Programs for Saving Jane. And uh, by storytelling, mostly, I mean right now, we write comic books uh, about human trafficking that educate kids about uh, this crime and empower them to protect themselves. 
amazing. And we'll talk about that at the end of our show today. Um, but to start our show, Claire, also known as Daltrek, do you want to tell everyone about what you do? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Claire. I also go by Daltrek. Claire is my normal name that I use professionally, but Daltrek is kind of like the artist persona. Uh, so yeah, super happy to be here. One thing that I do a lot of is, um, aside from electronic music and being a music technologist for my day job, I work a lot with youth and I work specifically a lot with girls and girls of color oh, um, in wow. empowering them through electronic music and making beats and other stuff like that. Because there's a, there is a, I was going to say deficiency, but like not necessarily deficiency, but there's a lack of representation for women of color in electronic music and even just music in general. So I feel like it's important to be visible and to represent and be out there. And that's what I try to encourage my kids to do as well. So, yeah. That's so fantastic. And you are performing for us today. So nice. how about you take it away? <laughs> sure, cool. So I'm just going to switch over right here, but everybody's going to see a little bit of a change in setting in a moment. Hopefully. And yeah, hi everyone. How's it going? <laughs> cool, but <laughs> it was like big switch over. But yeah, uh, like I said, my artist persona when I am performing a lot of stuff is doll trick and that's also the name that i make music under as well um and that's also the reason why i have the braids it's kind of like the the whole performance thing um but i'm really happy to be sharing music for today's awareness tuesday and i think it was um appropriate i think in a way to want to share a couple of tunes from an album that i released in april earlier this year it was called colors of us and it was an album that i actually created last year thanks to the queen's council on the arts i'm based in new york and i work a lot with the community in the local uh, new york city area uh, one thing that i did do last year thanks to the queen's council on the arts was a project with i think over about 50 young women or so but we made an album of new electronic music together kind of inspired by their experiences and mostly it was um, um, young women of Asian descent in particular in the borough. Um, so we did a bunch of that. So I'm going to share three tunes from that album tonight. And I think it's ones that I hopefully you all enjoy as well. And uh, yeah, these are from the album. It's The album is called Colors of Us and you can listen to it um, on every, pre pretty much everywhere now, like streaming, Spotify. Uh, we made it from scratch. So I conceptualized it with the girls as well. Um, and this first tune that I'll share, if it's, if I guess it's, I guess I should just like kick things off, I guess, <laughs> my fling stuff. Uh, but yeah, th this first tune that I'm going to share is called Sister, Sister. And it's actually about, you know, kind of um, questioning the world and asking, a, you know, an older sister figure for a little bit of assistance if you need that assistance. So this is Sister, Sister, and I hope you enjoy it. Damage to the world, but it's 
you enjoyed it um and yeah that was for my um i i keep saying upcoming because i used to do this a lot before the album was actually out but now it's out it's from my recent album from april called colors of us and i think it was uh, when we wrote the tune we were really thinking about um you know what it means to have a sister and for me growing up i never really had a sister i'm an only child so i was kind of always you know hanging out with my friends or older other older girls that I could look to as role models. So now that I'm an educator and that I'm older and I'm an artist as well, I really feel like it's important to be able to no, um, guide younger women when they need mentorship. And that's why I think it's also really great um, that I'm here on the same day as everyone at Saving Jane, because <laughs> it's kind of like, it it's means a lot to me. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here with everyone as well. Um, and the second tune that I'm gonna do is also from the album as well. Um, but it's a little bit of a, a different tone to it, I guess. This one's not so much about, you know, um, necessarily others, but it's more about yourself. And I think one thing that I learned a lot from working with um, youth is that oftentimes we, we as ad adults, like even I, I, I'm actually pretty old. I, <laughs> I joke about this with people, but like I'm much older than I, I kind of look. Um, but I, I feel like whenever we're working with youth, a lot of the time, sometimes we, we keep thinking, okay, they're kids, like what do they know? But they know a lot. And they, they have so much to believe in about themselves that sometimes I feel like we should lift them up. And there's been a lot of, um, you know, create kids celebrating creative adults, but I think there could be a lot more adults celebrating creative kids. Um, so this was kind of the way of, um, this song was that way of like lifting up my girls. So <laughs> this next tune is called Skylights. I hope you enjoy it. In my days on the weakness of my pride on the hurt that's closed my eyes I've hated my pain for the way it makes me fear for the road it leaves unclear no way to the skylight, dreaming beyond the limelight, baby it all comes natural, natural, naturally to me, and I might feel it within my mind's eye, baby I'm gonna catch it all, catch it all, catch it all.
you. Oh, it's like, it's like delaying a bit. <laughs> thank you so much. Yay, thank you. Um, I'm probably just gonna do like one more song and I'll just go right into it. But this was the, probably the last song um, that is on the, is on the album, <laughs> uh, which is called Chemistry. And in a way, it's a little bit of a fight song. So I'm kind of like hoping to leave and finish this on a, a, <laughs> a powerful note in a way. Um, but kind of related to what I mentioned just now about, you know, a lot of people overlooking certain, maybe some of your powers, some of your superpowers, whoever's listening out there. Um, this is uh, maybe, I hope, I hope that this song, you know, maybe is something that you can listen to and think of as a call to action in a way. I feel like each of us is so unique in the things that we do that no other person can do the things that you can do. Um, so for me, that's a lot of the reason why I do what I do as well, and maybe probably the rest of us also on this panel too. Um, so yeah, I wanted to end on this note. This last tune is from Chemistry. It's also it's also on the album Colors of Us. Uh, my name's Daltrek, <laughs> and it's it was a pleasure and an honor to perform with you and share music with you. So the last tune, Chemistry.
Cool. <laughs> Yay! Thanks so much, everyone. Unbelievable. Really appreciate it. My name's Daltrick uh, or Claire. Now I'm gonna go back to Claire right now. So, <laughs> thanks so much, everyone. Claire, Daltrick, that was so incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. It was a pleasure to share that with everyone. So thanks for having me. <laughs> the only thing that was missing was Thomas's dancing for the last two songs. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have had like a monitor here and be like. Oh, there's Thomas dancing. <laughs> oh, it's so much fun. It's, <laughs> Thank you. It's like um, social distancing dancing. The social safest dancing. kind. <laughs> the safest <laughs> kind of dancing. Well, you definitely set a standard there. It's going to be hard to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, amazing, Claire. Thank you so much again. Um, so now we're going to be viewing a short film from Indrani, who's joining us on the panel. Um, Indrani, do you want to tell us a little bit about your film before we watch it? Yeah, I'd love to. So this film um, was created in India uh, with a nonprofit there that uh, does amazing work. It's called Nani Kali. They help girls to avoid being trafficked. And a big part of what they do is support girls at risk. And uh, it was a really challenging subject to handle, um, but I, I shot it with the girls themselves who are at part of the, the nonprofit and who are at risk themselves, um, but they are extraordinary. And, uh, and I was so honored to work with Strawberry Frog and Nani Kali and GK Reed and uh, wonderful people that I met who joined us. And, um, I'll talk to you about it afterwards because I want to. I don't want to spoil any of it, but um, it's really appropriate right now. Right, right. Let's get into it. I can't wait to see it. I really believe that many of the challenges faced by old societies and impoverished societies can be boiled down to the education of women. Sons are considered as assets and daughters are considered as liabilities. Infant girls are killed. Yes, it is shocking. I think this film is going to have a major impact how to reach inside somebody's gut and get them to look at an issue. The Girl Epidemic was written by uh, the creative team at Strawberry Frog and directed by an uh, extraordinary uh, director named Indrani. This film is one of the most incredible pieces of film that I've seen in a long time. If you're watching a trailer of a movie, something which is about a biological epidemics, and when you get the twist, like in, in a classic short story, you find that what we are talking about is an epidemic of the mind. I was thrilled to work on this project with Strawberry Frog. Their concept was, was really quite genius to deal with such difficult, complex issues. So we wanted to, to create scenarios and metaphors that help people to visualize the real stakes of girls' education. gripping imagery that this film uh, uh, shows, uh, presented in obviously a commercial way, but done in a, just with tremendous uh, filmmaking skills. It almost feels like uh, Les Miserables, the, the, the movie in, in 60 seconds. <laughs> the script is, is very complex, and we initially were like, we should shoot this in Brooklyn, and that would have been horrible. It would have never worked out. But uh, we hooked up with Indrani, and GK, and uh, Arrow Films, and Everybody, we just, a lot of people came together and were passionate about this, this script, and things that were impossible happened. I chose to shoot this film handheld with a, almost a horror film kind of feel to it because I wanted to make the scenes as, as naturalistic as possible, even though it's all staged. Everywhere you go, you have a crowd, and everybody wants to see what you're doing, and so shooting around that was, I mean, there's obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. As a production designer and a costumer, one of our big concerns was, uh, you know, that balance between realism and, and something more fiction. And we really wanted to shock our viewers. 
We wanted to do something really startling. Provoke them to go to our website. And while you're there, make a donation. The girl epidemic understands that education of the girl child will allow girls to live a life of dignity. Women in charge of their societies, all of them seem to do wonderful things that impact on society in a much larger format. So to me, I zero and I just focus on the education of, of the girl child. And yes, I do believe it's a miracle cure. The epidemic is spreading all over. This part of the city is even worse. Everybody's panicking. We still wait for some help. Must contain the situation. Mama. Mama! It's a total mess. They can die for all I care. It's not my problem. Take them immediately. We have to do more to eradicate the epidemic. Honestly, at this point, it's like the air is contagious. Uh, and we're back. That was unbelievable. Wow. Um, thank you, Andrani. Uh, intense. Do we have any reactions? Yeah, extremely intense. And and so what an interesting way to, to you know, present this subject matter, Andrani. I thought it was brilliant. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about how the project came together and, and what inspired you to do this? Yeah, so what you just saw was actually a behind the scenes of uh, a little bit of the, the people in the foundation that are working um, on this effort, um, as well as the actual film itself. And uh, so, so the idea was to really capture people's imaginations in a very short amount of time, because we realize no one has time to grapple with some of these kinds of things that feel so distant from them. So we really wanted to bring it um, home to them in, with the full power of what these girls are really going through. But it's a metaphor. So we use the idea of a pandemic, an epidemic, um, as a metaphor because there is a, a, a pandemic of trafficking happening in the world today. The numbers are so huge and the effects on lives are so devastating that uh, you know the only thing you can really compare it to is what we're dealing with with COVID-19. So it was, we did this at a couple of years ago, so it was a little bit ahead of this uh, current situation, but I think that the, um, the comparison is apt because there's, there are millions and millions of women and children and boys as well, um, whose lives are devastated by this epidemic of trafficking. And so we wanted to really show people the stakes for girls' education, because that's one of the key uh, ways in which we can fight trafficking. But of course, we also need governments and local politicians and police to step up and stop this terrible menace that, um, that some young people are facing. Right, right. And I think a lot of people have the perception that this issue only happens in certain corners of the world. Do you wanna speak a little bit about how trafficking affects us here in the States and, and really worldwide? And Yes, trafficking has become a global 
epidemic and it's I believe it's the third biggest industry in the world right now it is so huge and there's so much money involved and so many people whose lives are destroyed by it and so many people who are involved on the other side as the the buyers of trafficking we often think about the victims and we forget about the people who are uh, causing the whole problem is the people who are purchasing um, these girls. And so it's very important that we recognize this is not happening somewhere else. It is happening everywhere. It is happening in most of the major cities in America. Um, if you are in a large city, you are probably in one of the hotspots of the world of trafficking. And so you have a responsibility. These are your neighbors. These are the people that you cross paths with and you may not recognize it because you haven't you're not looking for it, but uh, it's important that we educate people so that they can become part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Right, right. And you mentioned education as one of the prevention tools for this problem. So how about you expand on that a little bit for everyone watching and talk a little bit about your work um, as an educator um, and in fixing this problem? Absolutely. Well, I'm actually going to be teaching a class at Princeton this fall on using art for social justice and human rights. So it really fits in very well with what I've been doing, which is uh, to use our storytelling means of film and television to tell the important stories to not only entertain, but also to make people aware of the real, real situations in the world in which they live. You know, so often we use entertainment to escape, um, but the reality is that these are you know, terrible, terrible crimes happening and things, things that we can't just turn a blind eye to. So I think education is key, not only for the, um, the people who are in power, the people who can make the decisions that can support these girls and protect them, but for all of us, I think that we all need to be part of educating those people who are making those decisions. And by using our voices, by calling, by writing, uh, by donating to organizations like Saving Jane that's, that's doing such extraordinary work to really eradicate this problem and to provide um, support for the girls and women who come out from trafficking situations. So part of the problem is that it's not just, you know, people always say, well, why don't they run away? Well, where are they supposed to run to? It's very, very difficult um, for them to rebuild their lives without anyone to support them. Um, so it's very important that we provide education to girls and women who are in danger, as well as those who come out of the situations, and to the people who might actually be purchasing um, slave labor without realizing it, or perhaps they're just not thinking about it, but you know, educating that segment of the audience as well is very important. Right, right. Well, I think that's a great way to segue um, over to Kathy Ann, who's the founder of Saving Jane, and talk a little bit about um, what Saving Jane does to support that, that mission of education um, in order to increase awareness and prevention around human trafficking. Um, so Kathy, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what the mission of Saving Jane is? So the mission of Saving Jane um, started to empower human trafficking survivors by freeing them from the past trauma experience and our prevention program is the prevention of new victims, especially children with our comic book series. And going back to what Claire said, your superpower. Our superpower is educating children and empower them how to protect themselves. Amazing. Amazing. And I'll show you a little bit of our comic books that we have here. And then I will turn it over to Thomas. And this is Thomas' superpower. Right, Thomas, tell us a little bit about your work. It's, it's so unique to think, um, you know, we can spread awareness on trafficking through a comic book series. We have a film and, and also a comic book series here. Yeah, it's, it's uh, so, so exciting. Uh, we've created this comic book series with the help of the FBI and with uh, survivors of human trafficking and the city of New York and the mayor's office and, and educators to responsibly educate kids about human trafficking and then give them proven tools to protect themselves, like how to recognize a recruitment conversation, how to powerfully deal with a predator or a trafficker and who they can go to for help if they get into trouble. Um, you know, uh, 
I think uh, experts say that the best way to protect children is to educate them. And uh, so that's what we've done. Um, I also want to mention, um, you know, never before have traffickers had such easy access to so many children because of social media and, and the internet. It used to be recruitment happened one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. And um, I, I think um, that can be a lot scarier uh, um, because often traffickers were men and now, now it's been in women, but also it's happening over the internet and the internet, which is so famous for um, masking your real identity. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, so many, uh, you know, thousands, uh, a trafficker can initiate thousands of recruitment conversations a day over social media. Um, I, you know, I was recently doing a workshop in schools. We do workshops in schools and libraries and homeless shelters and YMCAs and churches. And uh, I was doing one in, in a school in, to second graders. Uh, second graders, the entire second grade was doing a workshop, which is very, very young for this kind of education. And I just asked all of them, how many of you have your own phones? And half of them raised their hands. And um, how many of you have your own social media accounts? All of them raise their hands. Even if they don't have their own phones, they have their own social media accounts. And, I, and then uh, one of the questions I asked was, how many of you have seen a post asking you if you wanted to make some money? They all raised their hands. Now, you know, not all, every job post is, is, is initiated by a trafficker, but, but that is a very common uh, recruitment technique from a uh, traffickers go online and find a kid who wants an Xbox who can't afford it or whose parents won't give it to them. And, and, you know, and say, hey, you know, I can help you make some money. Uh, that's one kind of recruitment uh, conversation that we have. You know, and just like everybody on the panel, what we've found, we, we had no idea if a comic book was going to be um, a, an effective educational tool, but, um, uh, you know, we started going into schools and it turns out that kids go nuts for comic books. And uh, we would go into schools and kids would talk their way out of their regular classes when they heard there was a comic book workshop because kids don't look at a comic book like a, a lesson plan or being in school or homework. They look at it as their form of entertainment. And I think I'm on a panel of people here today who are using entertainment to connect uh, with people and to address this incredibly serious crime. Uh, and certainly um, th that's kind of what, what we're doing here at Saving Jane and we're connecting with uh, many, many different kind of artists because we feel like there's so many uh, different kinds of entertainment available to young people now. And um, also so many kind of young people, so many kinds of young people who are really um, poised to join this counter-trafficking movement. Claire, I want to mention up in your neighborhood, we partner with a great organization called uh, Garden of Hope. And I, I love this organization. This organization, it's probably my favorite organization. And we, we uh, do workshops with their kids. This is an organization that rescues really a, lo a lot of immigrant women uh, women who are incredibly vulnerable to being exploited and to being abused. And um, uh, we are so, you know, um, I'm so excited to meet you, Claire. And, uh, um, and uh, I, I can't wait to work with you again in the future. Yes, me as well. Probably enough for me. <laughs> totally. Yeah, and I, I want to expand on that point you made about, um, you know, what makes somebody vulnerable to trafficking? Because so often we think we're immune to something like this happening. It's so unheard of. It can only happen in other countries. Um, you know, that seems to be the mentality I run into constantly um, in my own neighborhood. Um, so how about we talk a little bit about, you know, the factors that, that open someone up to, to this? We could all, all probably, oh, go ahead, Indrani. Oh, well, I was gonna jump in and say that I think one factor that people have in common around the world is that there's there's often a, a, a great vulnerability around people who don't realize their own self-worth. And I think that uh, certainly in India, you, uh, you know, in a social construct, as in um, much of the world, um, there is often a preference for boys over girls in terms of, of getting education, getting resources, because girls are not expected to be as economically 
uh, proficient when they grow up. And the main reason is because they're not getting educated. So that's, again, why education is so important, because then girls can have their own economic uh, in, uh, independence. And so their families don't have to support them for life. Um, but in the West, in America, uh, confidence is equally important, I think. And, uh, and a lot of times girls feel like they can't talk to someone um, and then a trafficker preys on that where they become the confidant, they become the person who, um, who provides another adult perspective for a young person that's dealing with lots of challenges. So um, I think it's very important that we recognize that they're, they're not just like in, in my film where there's guys coming and grabbing kids off the street. That's not really what, what happens. What happens is actually even more terrifying where people get into, into the confidence of these kids very often and become their only um, source of, of hope and education. Right, right. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'll jump in and just tell you a couple at-risk groups that, that yeah. are meaningful to me, and I'm going to throw out some statistics. So there are some studies that show that nine out of 10 victims of human trafficking have been through the child welfare system, have been through foster care, or who have been through group homes or been in contact. And we feel like this is a really important interruption. Get point. Into We're creating, an, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, actually, yeah. and I'm going to throw out um, the city of New York asked me to write an entire comic book series that would serve as kind of a survival guide for kids in foster care. You know, another uh, another fascinating um, statistic is that kids aging out of foster care, 50% um, of them are likely to be homeless. Can you believe that? 50% of kids aging out of foster care are, are going to be homeless at some point. And homeless kids are incredibly vulnerable to being uh, trafficked. Uh, one out of every five homeless kids is trafficked. One out of every four homeless girls is trafficked. One out of every three LGBTQ youth is trafficked. Um, they're, they're incredibly vulnerable. And so we feel, at Saving Jane, that this is an incredibly important interruption uh, point. And so uh, right now we are, uh, we've just, uh, you know, finished, um, working or writing a comic book, really addressing this issue among uh, kids who are in foster care. There are many other at-risk groups, uh, like Andrani said, poverty is a huge uh, part of that. Um, uh, also, uh, kids with a history of being uh, sexually abused, um, uh, is a big part of it. Immig immigrants, uh, people that kids that can't speak up to them for themselves and, and who are easily manipulated, uh, disabled kids. Uh, so any vulnerable population, um, they're, they're kind of, uh, uh, th that's who traffickers target. But you know, the thing is, is vulnerability, anyone can be made vulnerable. And, right. uh, you, you know, I was, <laughs> I was just watching this this horrific Vince Vaughn movie last night. He plays this thug, uh, incredibly big, strong guy. He's made vulnerable because as I can, you know, I'm a 60 year old, but I can be made vulnerable. And certainly young people, children are are probably the easiest kids to make vulnerable. And, and I think, um, let me just end by saying one of the most common recruitment uh, tactics of, of uh, traffickers is a relationship they are offering a relationship of some kind. Um, it, it, sometimes it's a romantic relationship. Sometimes it's a father figure. Sometimes it's, it's a, a mentorship. Uh, um, I mean, often it's a romantic kind of relationship and the trafficker will marry maybe his victim or be there, you know, the victim will consider the trafficker uh, his or her boyfriend. Um, so anyway, I'm talking, I'll stop. Yeah. No, I, and I just want to, and I just want to add something um, to piggyback of what Thomas said, and especially now, now that we are um, shelter in place, um, just pay attention. Pay attention to the new friends that your children have on social media. Right, right, and 
Um, I think, you know, Thomas, your point also about the relationship building, um, the time it takes for um, a victim to gain trust in their trafficker. Um, I think it's so important to talk about that aspect of trafficking because people are always like, you know, why, why doesn't the victim just run away or why don't they just get over this hurdle they're experiencing? Um, could we dive into um, what, you know, the grooming process looks like of trafficking and how it prevents victims from, from, from getting out um, and restarting their lives? Well, if, if I can jump in there for a moment. Um, so after I made this film, I won the CNN Exposé Award and, and I got to spend a lot of time talking to the folks at CNN who are doing a whole series of documentaries around trafficking. And one of the, the very interesting aspects was that so many documentaries deal with violence with you know kids that are kidnapped, but very few deal with this, the Romeo, um, Romeo lover kind of scenarios, which actually are very prevalent. And so a lot of times it'll be some someone that uh, that might be almost the same age as, as the person being trafficked or just a little bit older. You know, we often imagine that there are gonna be uh, these great differences between them, but there's often a lot more similarities. Often the uh, traffickers themselves have been trafficked uh, or have experienced other kinds of traumas of their own in their lives. So, um, so these are often a repeat cycle and, and there's a great deal of manipulation that happens. Sometimes um, kids or, or young people are, are groomed for periods of, of six months or a year even, during which time that, to, that trafficker invests so much love and attention and care that that, uh, that person really loses their sense of identity outside of this person. So, um, so it might be very difficult for families or for anyone else to, to see that uh, the dark uh, side that, uh, that is being held back. And then once that person is really um, in, in love or, or involved in a, in a deep way, uh, the tables turn and, and just horrific situations occur. And, uh, and then it's very hard for them to get out because they often also use that kind of emotional blackmail. They take photographs, um, they, they mm. isolate that young person from their usual family and friends. And so, you know, just like a cult um, kind of strategy, that person changes and they often get a new name, a new identity. It's a whole life-changing experience that they go through and very, very hard to reverse. And I think what that isolation instills and why it's so important to, to talk about this aspect is it creates a dissociation in the brain of a trafficking victim from who they are truly and then who they are when they're being trafficked and used. And that's, I think, what allows trafficking to what, what's allowed it to expand is these traffickers are traumatized themselves. Therefore, they're one person when they're, you know, trafficking victims, and then they're another person when they're not. So it almost allows it to be acceptable in their eyes. And, and, um, and you know, they trick themselves into thinking they're doing a good thing for these kids um, by, by taking them in and giving them support and love, um, even though it's, it's going towards um, an awful thing. So... Another thing that neuroscientists are saying is that uh, a young person's brain is an incredibly vulnerable place. So your, your emotions during your adolescence are going to be bigger than at any other time in your life. And if you can remember your first love, I mean, it, it was, uh, you, you know, you thought it was gonna last forever. You thought that this was it, that, that you'd never felt this way before, that this person was, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you couldn't even imagine breaking off a relationship uh, with this person, uh, you know, your head was spinning. And um, so uh, there are a lot of things about a, a young person's strain, brain that makes them incredibly vulnerable to especially the Romeo uh, uh, pimp scenario that Indrani was speaking of, of, of you know, having someone pay attention uh, to them um, and, and uh, falling in love with them, that, that falling in love process can happen very, very quickly, but also uh, dramatically and cause such a bond between them. Uh, and, and now also a, a lot of uh, neuroscientists are, are are doing a lot of research on trauma bonding. Uh, we used to call it Stockholm syndrome, but it was, it's, it's how, you know, not only are you connected to this person because of these huge emotions that you're feeling, but also through, through weirdly through trauma, 
and th and through the abuse that the sex industry itself will impose on you. Mm. Right, right. And something I've I've found shocking lately, just through my own research, is the extent of these trafficking rings and how many people outside of just the trafficker and their victim happen to be involved. Um, Jeffrey Epstein is somebody wow. who's risen to prominence in, in the media lately about his sex trafficking ring. And to think of somebody with that much power um, being involved in you know, this industry, um, it really just goes to show how much of a, of a bigger issue it is than, than we know it to be. Um, so could we also talk a little bit about the power players in this scenario and who is creating the demand um, for sex trafficking to happen? Anyone, take it away. <clears throat> I think one of the, the biggest challenges is that there are power players of all levels and that the, um, the, the people who are utilizing these services, the people who are paying for these kids to be kidnapped or, the, or to be trafficked um, are in all levels of society. So they're in every region and they're in every level of government as well. Uh, we can't expect that uh, any group of people is immune because uh, we've just seen the evidence that, that it is really prevalent. So part of the challenge is that uh, people who have a lot of power and influence can certainly use that uh, for their own benefit. Um, but on the other hand, there, you know, that's what's so exciting about the, this medium of social media, people can come together. There is so much that can be done by a, a large number of people joining their voices together and, and supporting um, fighting this issue. And no one is, is uh, able to be protected forever. We've seen with Jeffrey Epstein, I mean, it seemed for a long time like he was invulnerable because he had friends in such high places, but ultimately yeah. he did pay the ultimate price for what he was doing. And so I think that shouldn't be a story that makes us afraid. It should make us fight harder, realizing that yes, people can be brought down whatever position they're in if they're doing terrible things. Right, right. Um, so I would love to, you know, end on a note where we all we all kind of share um, about how we we fight trafficking or we fight causes because I think there's a lot of people out there who want to do something about this or maybe another issue, but they don't know how to get started. Um, so all of us have shared, um, you know, our work today and um, it's been super inspiring. So I'd love to just go around and um, if everyone could just share with our audience, you know, how to find a cause or how to get behind this cause and, and what to do um, to bring awareness to it. So let's start with education. So if you go to www.savingjane.org, you can read our comic books series for free, Good Girl Gone. And you can read this with your children from 10 years old and up. So that's an action you could take right now today. And if you don't have kids, you have cousins, you have, you know, friends, their kids. There, there's a lot of people you can reach. It's, it's important that you take an active role in, in helping to share this information. You know, uh, it, I also, I guess I should mention that that, you know, has there ever been a, another time in history uh, when a, a young person from their bedroom has such a far reach, you know, and this really empowers, <laughs> Claire knows this better than anyone, doesn't she? <laughs> uh, um, you know, you, uh, you can have, you can be an incredibly active uh, member of the counter-trafficking movement um, from the technology that's sitting on your desk and in the privacy of your own uh, um, um, uh, bedroom, you can be creating, you know, I think everybody here is really choosing uh, kind of, I'm going to just call popular entertainment to, to really raise awareness. And um, I think that's a great way to do it. Um, I, I also like what, what uh, uh, Kathy Ann said, you know, there are nonprofits all over the world, um, uh, as Ethan was mentioning, find find a, an issue that you just automatically burn when you when you hear it, or you or you're you, you know it, 
it ignites a kind of passion in you. Uh, and then get involved in that because you're going to wake up and in your free time, you're, that's the, the passion is going to, to really, uh, uh, really motivate you and, and energize you, uh, you know, to, to spend time in that. And I, you know, if, if you're moved by what we're doing and, and uh, this issue, this crime of human trafficking, by all means, uh, get, get involved with us. Um, we're all uh, in, involved in each other's projects a little bit. And uh, we would love, love, love for you, for instance, uh, Kathy and I, uh, to be a part of Saving Jane for sure. Yeah, totally. Maybe even just to pick you off a little bit what Thomas said, because I was going to pretty much say the same thing. But I feel like a lot of the sometimes the loss of what to do is also kind of stemming from not being able to, um, in a way, make that connection between something that you care for and then finding that physical thing out there. But sometimes it's also really interesting to even look in your own community. Like, you don't have to go, like, super international or, like, work with an organization in, like, a different continent even, but your local community. I know it's hard now because we obviously are all at home. <laughs> but, like, when, when we're not in quarantine, like, just going out, um, seeing what's going on in, in your own neighborhood, like, you know, local organizations that are doing lots of different things, they could just be around the corner from you and maybe you haven't just looked in that direction or you haven't been actively um, looking there yet, but now that you've you know watched us talk about this, you'll you'll know to be looking out for these things and finding ways that you can support um, not just the people and not even like in your own community, but maybe even at, at home. Like maybe you have never thought that you'd be able to influence like your your neighbor's child upstairs or something like that, but you totally can. And I think there's a lot of underestimated and overlooked power and just the little things that we can do for people. So. I love that, you know, look look close to home, but also if if it moves you to, to look at other countries as well, I mean, there are really, your dollars can go so far totally. uh, in, in other places as well. So in India, where I'm from, I run a school called cschool.org and we provide education for girls and women um, and we help fight against the possibility of these kids getting trafficked and, uh, you know, with $1, you can, you can educate, 10 kids for, for a whole week. So um, there's so many ways you have to do what feels right for you and, and really do everything you can. And it's not always about giving money. There's, you can give your time, uh, you can give your skills. You know, there's a, a lot of artists I work with, musicians and, and uh, actors, and they, they donate their time to causes and that can be incredibly valuable. And even if you're not a big star yet, you might just get discovered doing what it is that you love if you're doing it for a good cause. So important to know. Um, and, and really clear, yeah, exactly what you said and what Indrani said about just looking out there and, and seeing what moves you. Um, human trafficking, it's so interesting. We've had so many different artists and co-panelists um, on this show and um, from, from all areas of the world. And, um, you know, everyone's seen human trafficking on some level. Um, so just to bring it back to, you know, what we're all talking about today, human trafficking is, is everywhere and anywhere these days. So um, it's great that we can come together and give people, you know, the vocabulary and, and the tool set to articulate um, about this problem so we can we can really fight it. Um, so with that, um, I want to just thank all of you guys so much for being here. Um, Saving Jane, you can actually donate to um, right here by watching this podcast. Um, I believe there's a link somewhere on the screen. Um, so definitely, if you can right now, please, um, please uh, consider it. And um, before we all go, I'd love to go around and uh, tell our audience where they can find us on social media. And I am at Ethan B. Paisley on all platforms. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm at Daltrick, D-O-L-L-T-R-I-C-K on all platforms, except my actual artist name is spelled D-O-L-L-T-R exclamation point C-K. So on Spotify, <laughs> you might have to look over there. But otherwise, if, if exclamation points aren't allowed, it's an I instead. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can find us at um, www.savingjane.org on Facebook and on Instagram. I also want to point out another website that we have, uh, www.abolitionista.org. And that, that uh, site looks 
like a, ch a kid's entertainment site where you can read comic books and you can join uh, um, book reading groups and, and film groups. And it, and it does not look like an educational <laughs> site. It looks like an entertainment <laughs> site. And I'm at indrani.com and Indrani PC on social media. So um, I really hope to see you all and uh, see you guys doing really exciting stuff to make the world better because you do have the power. Your superpower, everyone has a superpower. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and also <laughs> just uh, in case anyone wants to keep in touch with Launch and everything we're doing, um, you can find us at Launch Global. Uh, we just unveiled our virtual concert venue. We're going to be doing a lot of great festivals and all sorts of humanitarian stuff like this. So that's launchglobal.tv and launchglobal on all socials. So thank you, our amazing panelists. Thank you, Andrani, for the unbelievable gripping film. Thank you, Claire, for the unbelievable, thank you. brilliant, <laughs> polished, gorgeous electronic music. It was like we we're out there partying in the old days. <laughs> and thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this. And uh, yeah, we're just getting started. Awesome. We'll see you guys in two Tuesdays from now. Thank you. Ooh, thank, thank you. you for coming. Stay safe. Bye bye. Bye.